Hey everyone, my name is Anthony Wright. This is my wife Chandra, and we are the pastors of Just Christ Ministries. We are so excited you have decided to join us for this worship experience. We're a church designed with the community in mind, working on the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. Thank you again for joining us. Let's go into service. Whoa! 
Hallelujah, 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 God, hallelujah, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. If you're able to join us and just connect in to worship this morning, he deserves it, he deserves it. All over the building, just lift your hands and just bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for who you are, God. Hallelujah. Bless your name, God. you 
you shall receive them. Good things God has for you if you believe you shall receive them. scripture came to mind that says when we pray according to God's will we should believe we have what we ask for 
Amen. I guess the problem is, is what we want according to God's will. Amen. But when we pray according to God's will, we can shout, we can rejoice because we know that God hears us and he answers our prayers. Can we give Jehovah Jireh a hand clap of praise? The God that provides and meets all of our needs according to his riches in glory. I don't know about y'all, but God takes care of me. Come on. Is there anybody's testimony that God taking care of you? How you may not have everything you want, but I declare he has given you everything that you need. Can we just lift our hands in God's presence just for a moment? Just for a moment. Just for a moment to all. This is a time of worship. And let's just let God know how much we love him, how much we appreciate him, how much we adore him. God, we have come for no other reason, God, but to magnify your name to publicly boast of your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your kindness, God. God, we thank you for looking beyond our faults and meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. God, you're awesome. You're great. You're magnificent. Come on, declare what God's been to you. He's been my healer, my deliverer, my mind regulator. He's been my friend. He's been my brother. Hallelujah. He's my counselor. He's my lawyer. Hallelujah, he's my all in all. God, we give you glory on today. We honor you. Can we just stand in God's presence just for a moment? Hallelujah. If you don't mind, just for a moment, begin to open your mouth and begin to praise and worship your God. He is worthy. He is worthy of all the glory, all the honor. It belongs to him. Let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath, praise you the Lord. For this is the Lord has made and we're rejoicing and we are glad in it. Hallelujah. Give God one more hand clap of praise. You may be seated in God's presence. I want to start off by wishing all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day. Let's give all of our mothers a round of applause. Amen. This is your day. We acknowledge you, we accelerate, we celebrate you for all that you do because we would not be who we are. We wouldn't even be here, period, if it were not for you. I thank and praise God for my wife and as a mother of my children. I appreciate you. And I also want to thank God for, I want to thank God for the mothers who did not birth children. Amen. Because you have spiritual mothers who have filled in the gap and stepped in because I believe that all women have that maternal instinct whether you birthed the child or not so I'm going to just commend all the women uh, that biologically birthed kids those who have not and I'm going to also take this time to pray for those who are grieving the loss of a mother you know um, grief has no timetable and days like this you know birthdays anniversaries they trigger that so I want you all to celebrate as the kids here the memories the good times, the blessing that you had with your mother. Amen. Also, I want to wish those who have a happy birthday, a happy birthday. Amen. Some of you guys are celebrating anniversary. I know Raster Rakia had, how many years is it? 16 years, Raster Rakia. Marriage, amen. I know Mother Moore had a birthday. Any other birthdays just passed this month? Mother Moore's birthday was yesterday. We thank and praise God for her. I know she's watching. We want to also take this time to congratulate all of our graduates. Amen. Those who are online who are graduating. Amen. High school. Amen. Grammar school. College, we celebrate you all. This is a wonderful time of year. Amen. We're able to just celebrate. The sun is shining. Amen. So that makes it also a great day. I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, this Saturday at 1230, we are having our Youth and Adult Leadership Summit. And so I'm asking everyone that's a part of this church, a part of Ring of Oak, to please come out this Saturday at 1230. We're going to be having two sessions, one session for the adults and one session for our children. Only 45 minutes. So when one group is in the session, other will be eating. They may have some good fellowship. So we need to get a head count today of who's coming to make sure we have enough food to really have a great time. Once again, we're very fortunate to have someone uh, from um, John Maxwell leadership team. 
If you all know anything about leadership, John Maxwell is the who's who of leadership. So we have somebody coming from his team to give us some leadership skills for free. Amen. So we're looking for adults and young people to be here at 1230. Please see my wife and confirm your attendance. Also, I announced last week that we are running in the race against violence. And we are raising money to support our strategic social investment, which includes youth programming, mental health, job skills training, job placement. Amen. I missed something. I'm sorry. And food, food security. Amen. So we are believing God that he's going to do some great things through our ministry. Let me say this. We support what we believe in. How many of you all believe that our community needs a strategic plan? Come on now. And guess what? It has to come from us. See, we think and praise God for the stimuluses and the grants and stuff like that, but we can't wait for other people to come and save us. I know people are on fixed incomes and what have you, but everybody can give something. If it's $5, $2, don't just like and share. Give something because we know our community needs mental health. We know our kids need programs. We know that food is a problem in our community. Jobs is a problem. So we're trying to make a difference in our community. And I'm asking you guys who are connected to this vision to support it. Hey Amen. I was talking to Frazier. This is not the responsibility of a few people in the church. When you are connected to a church, you are connected to the vision. And you should be given financially, physically, praying, amen, so the vision will come to pass. Is there anybody excited about being a part of a church that has a vision? Not just to build buildings to have services, but to have an impact in our community. That's what it's about. It's about us, us building institutions and leaving a legacy that will live on behind us. When I drive through this community, I do not accept this as a norm. I don't accept it. I do not accept I will not accept it. As long as there is breath in my body, I'm going to do whatever I can to make a difference. Because see, there are some of us who are old enough to reminisce, and you still have the nostalgia of what things used to be like. And I refuse to not let my kids experience what I experienced growing up. So I need you all's help. Because I tell you, this ain't about me. I don't know why I'm hooked. This, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not getting no extra money out of it. It's all about serving. It's all about purpose. So I'm asking every member of this church, everybody connects to us online to give something towards our strategic investment plan so we can make the difference God has called us to make. Amen. Can you all help me with this? I mean, I mean, if it's five dollars, two dollars, share, we with with that, this is gonna happen, you all. Listen, y'all, let me show y'all something. If you all could see what God's doing behind the scenes. I mean, listen, God is sending grant writers for free. He's sending architects for free. Everything we need, God is supplying. Everything we need, he is supplying. Why? Because it's according to his vision. It's according to his vision. So we thank and praise God for that. With that said, it's time to give. I thank and praise God for all of you all, for your past, present, and future support, because we could not do what we do without you. Now, those who want to give in the building, please raise your hand. The usher will assist you with an envelope you're giving in the building. Those who are giving online, amen, our cash app is dollar sign JCM Chicago. Once again, it's dollar sign JCM Chicago. You could also text to give at area code 773-455-0008. Text the word give. Once again, that's area code 773-455-0008. Text the word give. You can also give through our Tithely app. So we're thinking, praising God, that we have multiple ways for you to give. I want to encourage, again, every member of our church to be a faithful giver and tithe payer. Amen. God blesses us for our giving. And I think and praise God, you can't be God given. Amen. The more you give to him, the more he's going to supply back to you. We can only give because he's first given to us. He said he will give seed to the sower. 
So if you're not sowing, you don't need no seed. But when you sow into God's kingdom, he's going to make sure you have all the seed that you need. I'm going to ask the to come forward now and receive the offering. While they are coming forward, we have a special dedication. Amen. Those of you all know our very own David Pulley, he wrote a song. Amen. A song remembering his mom. And it's a wonderful song. And we want to dedicate that song to everybody in the building, everybody online. It's only three minutes. And for those of you all whose mom is not here, take this time to remember your mom as you hear this song in a positive way. Come on, go ahead, Mr. Don. Come on, ushers. The song should be playing now, please. That's okay. We'll be patient. We tested it before we did it, but God is good. Show the joy in the way. 
Let's give David a hand, you guys. Amen. This is for my mama. Amen. Some people are getting emotional. This is their first Mother's Day without their mom, but amen. We want to just thank and praise God for the mothers and the mother figures that we've had in our life. Amen. You all can purchase that song on Amazon Music, Google Play, Spotify, Apple Music. I remember you, right? And, I, and, I, and I'll say this. I'll say this. As a pastor, David's been with us 15, how many? 15 years. This is a man of God. A man of God. And you know, and you can't say that about many musicians. And I'm not knocking musicians, but a faithful man of God who has served. You know, it was, it's not about money for him. He loves the Lord. And he ain't got no side gig playing secular music. If it ain't gospel, he ain't playing. We, we've had weddings and stuff like that. And we asked David to play. He said, I ain't playing it. <laughs> so we thank and praise God. Give him one more hand clap of praise. Listen, go out, buy it, support him. Amen. We have, we have to support our own. Let me say it again. We have to support our own. Amen. So with that, see, I want to thank and praise God for those who are here, those who are joining online. And as always, it's my prayer that during our time together that something will be said or done to encourage you in your faith walk. And if you don't know Jesus, it is my prayer that you will come to know him on today. Now, we are continuing our series for this month entitled, somebody say audit. And we understand that an audit is an official inspection of an individual organization's account. So we justified and we talked about how we're not talking about being audited by the IRS, but we are talking about a spiritual audit that we all have to be prepared for. How many know Jesus is coming back? He's coming back. And, and when you look at the signs of the times, those of us who are in our word, we're not surprised by what we're seeing. The Bible talks about wars and rumors of wars, violence, pestilence, disease. All of these things were prophesied, if you will, in Scripture leading up to the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me tell you all something. When he comes back this time, ain't going to be no spitting on him. Ain't going to be no cross. He's coming back in power. He's coming back for the church. And so we have to be ready for this audit. Look at Romans 14, Romans 14, verses 11 to 12. It says, for it is written in scripture, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So one day we all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. We one day have to give an account for how we live our lives. And I want to reassure you all, as believers, we're not having to give an account if we're going to heaven or hell. Because once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to heaven. But we will have to give an account as to whether or not we lived our lives according to God's standard. You know, I think it is unfortunate that we as believers have lowered God's standard to make God's standard what we want to do and call it God. But God has a standard, and we have to make sure as believers that we are living our lives according to God's standards as it pertains to the word of God. And listen, none of us are perfect. We're all striving for perfection. We're all being sanctified, being more and more like Christ, but we have to call the standard what it is. And we can't let culture, we can't let people, we can't let ourselves lower God's standard. If God says it's right, it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't care what they legislate. I don't care what popular opinion. We go with the word of God, God's standard. Look at 2 Corinthians, our theme scripture, verses 13 to 5. Let's see my cousin Johnny back there. 2 Corinthians 13 to 5, in the Amplified. You got to say amen. It says, test and evaluate yourself to see whether you are in the faith and living your life as committed believers. So we have to test, evaluate our life to say, look, am I living a committed life 
to Christ. I'm not talking about that wishy-washy, one day in, one day you out. Are we living a committed life to Christ? It says, examine yourself, not me. See, we need to stop looking and judging other people and look in the mirror. Because we're so quick to say who ain't saved, who ain't living right. Who, the Bible says, look at yourself. It says, or do you not recognize this about yourself? By an ongoing experience that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test and are rejected as a counterfeit. So during this series, we're doing a self audit. We're not looking. At, we're looking at ourselves. God, look, am I doing the things I need to be doing as a Christian? Now, if you're not, there is therefore no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. But we need to repent. And we just start doing those things that we need to do. Now, as I was preparing for this message, I did an observation. And during my observation, I realized that there are many people that come into the church. And when they come into the church, they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't come to hear what God has to say. They want to hear what they want to hear. And if you are not saying what people want to hear, if you're not emotionalizing them, making them jump or shout, they'll tune in or stop coming to church. I had to ask myself. I said, man, are, are, you, are you still being effective as a pastor? I said, because people ain't jumping and shouting. People ain't singing your praises. I said, God, you know what, though? But I'm saying what you told me to say. And that's all that matters. See, you cannot compromise the word of God or what God tells you for the sake of people and popularity. And so what I've seen is that people, they want to come to church to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth all the time. But as a clinician, what I found is that people will go to a therapist because they want the truth. They tell a therapist, what's wrong with me? How do I fix this? How do I get myself together? And as much as we need to know the truth about our clinical well-being, we need to also know the truth about our spiritual well-being. Because we talked about it being spirit, soul, and body. And so with this being Mental Health Awareness Month, I encourage everybody to make sure that your mental health is where it needs to be. But also, spiritually, you need to know the truth. The Bible says ye shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. It said, I wish above all things that you will prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So it's not just spiritual, it's also mental. It's also physical. We're talking about the whole person. Look at 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 5. Can you receive beyond your emotions? Because some people only receive from emotions. If, if you've been entertained or, or, or made to feel good, other than that, you can't receive. But can your spirit bear witness to the truth, whether you like it or not, whether it makes you happy or not, but because it's the truth according to God's word. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 5. You got to say, I got it. It says, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instructions that challenge them with God's truth. It says, but wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold. We look for people who will amen our mess. Verse 4, and will turn their ears away from the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions, and will accept the unacceptable. It says in verse 5, But as for you, be clear-headed in every situation. Stay calm and cool and steady. Endure hardship without flinching. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duty of your ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the duty of your ministry. When we talk about during a self-audit, we need to understand that as believers, we're going to be held accountable for the Great Commission. How many of you all by a show of hands know what the Great Commission is? Let me see your hands. I see a couple of hands up. Because this is something that we all are going to be held accountable for. Now, before Jesus went back to heaven, he gave his disciples a commission. He told them what he wanted them to do. Look at Matthew 28. We'll examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. 
if this is what Jesus wants us to do, called the Great Commission, we have to know what it is, and we have to know if we're doing it or not. Matthew 28. You got to say amen. amen. It says, Jesus come up, I'm sorry, Jesus, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It says, go therefore and make disciples of some nations. All nations. Help the people to learn of me. Believe in me and obey me. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. This is the commission that Jesus gave to the church, that we are to go to all nations and preach the gospel, to teach them to observe everything that he has taught us. This is our responsibility, that of sharing our faith with other people. Now, there has been a misconception in the church for years. And the misconception is that discipleship and evangelism is a responsibility of a few people in the church with titles. Or well, it's, it's the pastor's job to evangelize. It's the evangelist's job to evangelize. But every born-again believer, we have been called to evangelize. Tell somebody, you an evangelist? You say, I don't know a bunch of scriptures. You know, your testimony. This, that one guy said, look here. He said, I don't know what's going on. He said, I don't know that I once was blind, but now I see. What was he doing? He was evangelizing, telling his testimony. One day I lost my job, and I prayed to God. God gave me a job. You're testifying of the goodness of the Lord. Everybody has a testimony. Everybody should be evangelizing, telling other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. So as we examine ourselves as to whether or not we're in the faith, we have to ask ourselves, have we been fulfilling the Great Commission? Have we been sharing our testimony? Have we been leading the lost to, to Christ? Because see, we've gotten off into materialism, and our faith has only been about material things. Cars, houses, position, favor, fame, and we have forgotten about the lost. Do you know Jesus said that he came for the lost? That, that was his mission to save the lost, which included us. And those of us who were once lost but have now been found because Christ is in us, we now finish the work that he started. Y'all better hear me on today. We talked about Christ. Why is he in you? He's in you to, for, to finish the work he started. The Bible says, as Jesus is, so are we in the world. We are Christ's ambassadors. Y'all don't believe me. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. When, when, when we get to the fundamentals or the basics of our faith and begin to do that, we'll see a difference. In us, in our world, in our society, but we have gotten away. But we're examining ourselves to make sure that no matter what everybody else is doing, I'm going to make sure I'm in the faith. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. It says, so we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God, were, as though God was making his appeal through us as Christ's representatives pleading with you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So we are Christ's ambassadors. He is gone, but he's left us here, and we're pleading with people to be reconciled with God, letting them know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in what our parents will have everlasting life. That's the, God, that's the good news. See, we're not telling people stop drinking, stop smoking, take that lipstick off. That, that's not the good news. The good news is God loved us so much he gave his only begotten son to die for our sins. And guess what? God can forgive you of anything. God has a plan, a purpose for your life. That is good news for those who were lost. At least it was for me. When I was lost and somebody told me that Jesus loved me, that he will forgive me of all of my sins, that he had a plan and purpose for my life. Oh, man, what can I sign up at? But we're not sharing with people the good news. We're not sharing our testimony. See, there are some people that knew us back then. And they see us today, but guess what? We don't give God the glory. Well, I went back to school and got myself together. 
I went to a program. You did what? It was the grace of God. We have to learn how to give God the glory so other people want to serve the same God that we serve. Jesus was concerned about the lost. And guess what? It wasn't just about having apathy or pity in them. Jesus was so concerned that he did something. Look at Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. I know it's Mother's Day. Don't get mad at me. Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. So Jesus was concerned to the point where he wasn't just apathetic or pitying people. He did something. He, he wanted to make a difference. It says, Jesus went through all the cities and villages of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. His words and his works reflected his messiahship. His words and his work, all right? See, we don't mind giving the words, but you're going to add works with your words. The Bible said faith without works is what? It's dead. It says in verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowd, he was moved with compassion and pity for them. When he saw the state of the people, he didn't just say, oh, I feel so sorry for him. The Bible said he was moved with compassion. He wanted to do something. I don't know about y'all, but it's hard for me to watch the news nowadays. It's hard for me to walk up and down my street and see the conditions of my community and not feel compelled to do something. Anybody feel that way sometimes? It's like, man, God, what can I do? How can I make a difference? How, how could I impact somebody's life? It says, but they were dispirited and distressed like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37 says, then he said to his disciples, he says, the harvest is indeed plentiful. He said, but the workers are few. He says, so pray to Lord of Harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Jesus didn't say pray for a house. He didn't say pray for a car. Because the Bible says that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else. He'll give you the car. He'll give you the house. He says, seek first the kingdom. He said, pray for more laborers because the harvest is ready. The people are sick. The people are hurting. Stop praying for material things and pray for laborers to go out and bring in the harvest. See, when I talk about our social investment, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do we provide tools and resources because the harvest is coming. Listen, you talk about inflation, you talk about wars, a pandemic, people are ready for the gospel. People are looking for hope. People are looking for the good news. Isaiah 68 says this. It says, when I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for me? Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Send me, I'll go. There is a clarion call going out now. With all this murder and violence and poverty, God is saying, who can, who can I send? Who will go out and represent me? And there are those of us who have been blessed by God, who have seen the power of God, delivering power of God. And when you learn how to appreciate what God has done in your life, you don't mind being used by God. I tell y'all this, when God saved me, it was nothing special about me. He, he brought me out to send me back in. Y'all better hear me on today. If he brought you out, it wasn't for you just to look pretty and walk around and brag about what you got. If he brought you out, he brought you out to send you back in. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. When you're in the trenches, you remember what it feels like to be hurting. See, some of us, we got to feel good now. We don't, we don't remember what it means to, to, to go without or to hurt. But when you start talking to people and realize, you know what? There are people struggling out here. People are really going through but we got the power of God. We got the favor of God. How is that impacting somebody besides you? How is that being a blessing to other people? But see, the problem is we won't let God use us. We won't evangelize. We won't fulfill the Great Commission because we're so concerned about what people think about us. I don't, I don't want people judging me. I don't want people talking about me. You know, we're so concerned about pleasing people at the expense of pleasing God. 
God's been better than me than any of y'all. And if I want somebody mad at me, I don't want it to be God. So if me pleasing God makes you mad, get over it. Because I'm not going to displease God to please you. So we have to understand we can't be ashamed of the gospel. I know, listen, I know it's difficult in this world that we live in now, this anti-God, this anti-right. You know, we live in this cancel culture where you say anything that society disagrees with, you're canceled. I'm going I'm to not follow you. You're going to get fired. So it takes a boldness to stand for God. Look at Luke 12, 89. Luke 12, 89. Are y'all still with me? It says, I say to you, whoever declares me openly and confess me before men, speak freely of me as his Lord. It says, the son of man will also declare openly and confess him as one of his own before the angels of God. When you are bold about your faith and you confess who you are in God, God says, look, that's, that's my daughter. Look out for her. The Bible says angels hearken at the voice of the Lord. Come on now. How many times have you may have been in an accident? Somebody was about to rob you. And you say something happened. Oh, once something happened, that was divine intervention. God has ministering angels that he would dispatch on your behalf. He says, so when you confess me, I look, look, y'all better watch out for Angie. Watch out for Renee. Look, that's my daughter. But it says in verse 9, but he who denies me for men will be denied in the presence of the angels of God. So we have to not be afraid to represent who we are in God. How many of y'all want to become bold in your faith? The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. We got to get radical about our faith, people of God, because once again, Jesus Christ is coming back. And we don't want to be labeled as somebody who sat on the sideline. There is a spiritual battle going on. And you have to choose you this day who you're going to serve. Evangelism. It's not just giving people the word of God. It's your lifestyle. See, sometimes your life speaks louder than what you say. Because we can say one thing and do another. So we have to understand that it's not just going to people saying, you, you know, the Bible said this or the Bible said that. I hear what you said. Okay, now I'm going to watch you. I, I want to see if your lifestyle match what you're preaching. And unfortunately, we've seen so many people who are inconsistent in their faith. And it's not judging them, but it's going to ultimately affect your witness because people are watching us. You know, my wife, she watches me. See, y'all see me on Sunday mornings for about an hour. And I can act right for an hour. But she sees me 24-7. And so I have to be mindful of the fact I'm not just her husband. I'm also her pastor. So I have to now treat her a certain way, live a certain way. She goes through my phone. I don't have any password on my phone. She has my email. So every, every look, everything is an open book. Why? Because I want to be accountable. I want to be accountable. You know why? Because when there is no accountability, it leaves room for the devil. So, so look at Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 5. It's a lifestyle. Paul said that we are living epistles. Now, you read the epistle, but Paul said you should be a living epistle. You should, be, you should be the word embodied, the word coming alive inside of us. Because sometimes you're the only Bible people are going to read. Amen. Look at Matthew 5. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, its purpose, how can it be made salty? It says, it is no longer good for anything but to be thrown down and walked on by people it says, when the walkways are wet and slippery. Verse 4 says, you are the light of Christ to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamppost, and it gives light to all in the house. So we're not trying to hide our faith. We're trying to promote it. We're trying to put it where everybody can see it says, let your light 
so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and honor and glorify the Father who is in heaven. So through your lifestyle, not always your words, will cause people to come into the faith. Amen. And we're not perfect. How many of y'all mess up like me sometimes? And when you mess up, you confess, you repent, and you tell people, you know what? The way I talk to you is not, not of God. You can't just do anything any kind of way and say, well, God knows my heart. No, no. You have to acknowledge to the people that what I did was not of God. That was not God's standard. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Last verse. Look at Acts. Acts 1 and 8. I'm almost done. Acts 1 and 8. So we're going to just really get some practical things that it relates to evangelism real quick. Acts 1 and 8. We talked about part of the test being Jesus being in us in terms of us being in the faith. Because once you accept Christ, he comes on the inside of us. It says in Acts 1 and 8, it says, But you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So when Christ comes in us, we receive power and ability, not just to dance and shout and run. I mean, all that stuff is good. But he says, I've given you this ability for you to be my witness. Part of God's power flowing through us is for us to be able to evangelize to the world. Because without the power of the Holy Spirit, God can't use us. Come on, talk to me on today. We, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. He says to be his witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So God gives us his spirit for one reason, to empower us to be witnesses. He told his disciples, I want you to evangelize in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Now, Jerusalem represented evangelizing to your family and closest friends. Your family is your first ministry. See, we don't want to step over our family and go save the world. No, you got people in your house that ain't saved, cousins. Look, he said, go to Jerusalem. Make sure you minister in your house. And I'm going to tell you all something. I've been guilty of neglecting my house for ministry. I was with my son Josh the other day, and we were going shopping or what have you, and I could not be in the moment thinking about service. I got to preach tomorrow. Guys, you're doing ministry now. Me, without a Bible, without an organ player, spending time with your family is ministry. And if, look, and if you don't do it, you will see it in your household. Your household will be told upside down. Joshua said this. He said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And so when you talk about family and just family dynamics, sometimes it's hard for me to be a pastor and a dad. So I got to balance it in such a way where I'm able to minister to him. Because he listens to music sometimes I don't like. And I can say, turn that off. Cut that off. I just listen to it. Why? Because we're building a relationship. See, evangelism comes through relationship. So you want to do a drive-by. Jesus loves you. No, sometimes you got to sit with people, talk with them, call them to build that relationship to make their heart fertile ground to receive the word. So he said, go to Jerusalem first. Go to Jerusalem first. Spend time with your family. Don't ever neglect your family for ministry, business. None. Your family comes first. He said, go to Jerusalem and start there. He said, then go to Judea. Now, Judea represents evangelizing within your cultural group. All right? These are people that like the same music you like. They may be the same ethnicity, maybe like the same art or music. And because you have things in common with them, it's easy to evangelize with them. Come on now. Rats and I go back, what, 30 some years? 30 some years. So I know, like, like this, I know it. I know what he likes. I know the kind of music. We can be in the same era. So if I want to talk to him, I have to use things we can relate to. See, you can't evangelize to somebody using scriptures and things they can't relate to. So you have to be relatable when it comes to evangelism. And sometimes, like me, I'm getting older. It's hard to relate to younger people. So I ask them, God, Josh, what's the, what's the new songs out now? 
What's the new, what's the new lingo now? Because when you talk their language, guess what? They'll hear what you're saying. And last but not least, he said, go to Samaria, which represents going cross culture. So it's like now you're talking to people who are not of your same ethnicity, who may not have the same likes in food and cuisine, all of that stuff. But he said, don't just stay with your family and within your culture. He said, go into the world. See, some of us, God has given us a commission to go into the world. So we have to deal with our insecurities, our prejudices, because God's given us a strategic plan, a great commission for us to go out into the world. Anybody excited about your mission? Come on now, that God is taking you places. He's bringing you around people, not just because of you, but for him, for you to glorify him. And it's not going to always be opening up the Bible. It will oftentimes be through your lifestyle. So whether we're evangelizing to family, to our culture, or cross-culture, here's things we have to do. First of all, we have to pray. We have to pray for wisdom. Somebody say amen here. We have to pray for ourselves, and we have to also pray for the people we evangelize into. We have to also model. We have to live out our faith around those we are evangelizing to. We have to also extend grace, realizing it doesn't happen overnight. Realize that people are going to mess up. We have to give them grace. And last but not least, we have to recognize that we are not saving nobody. You, you ain't got the power to save nobody. It is not your job to save anybody. The Bible says some plant, some water, but it's God that asks to increase. So when you're talking, you have to ask yourself, look, am I planting the seed or am I watering the seed? But at the end of the day, it is God that adds the increase. So as we examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing or fulfilling the Great Commission? Are we looking for opportunities to share our faith? Because God's creating them. Right now, you have people around you right now who are lost. People who are going through and back to the stage and states, and you have what they need called the Word of God. Give it to them. Amen. It should, it should not be your best kept secret. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. There may be somebody in the room right now online that does not know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're the person we're, we're trying to reach on today. God loves you with an everlasting love. And he said there is nothing that will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He loves you that much. And if you're watching right now and you just don't know if your salvation is secure, now is your time, now is your opportunity. If you're online or in the building, and I'm talking to you, let's pray this prayer. Bow your head, please. Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe you sent your son to die for my sins. Come into my heart. Save me. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. It, look, if you prayed that prayer in the building or online, and your sins have been forgiven, you are saved, you are born again believer. Once you accept Christ, you need to join a church where you can be a part of the fellowship and you can also grow in your faith. But you only want to join the church that Christ is leading you to. If God's called you to this church, whether online or in the building, we'll accept you now. If there's one, if you're online, you can text the number 773-455-0008. Text the word JOIN. Once again, that's 773-455-0008. Text the word JOIN. Is there one in the building? Is there one in the building? Give God one more hand clap of praise. Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I'm going to tell you all something in closing. You know, I'm experiencing. It's really making me happy and fulfilled in my faith. It is seeing God replicate what he did in my life in somebody else's life. As we work with the kids in our program, and I see how they behave, how they act, how they think, I see myself in them. 
I said, man, God, I, I see what you're doing. I see how you're using us to be a blessing to other people. And that makes life worth living. I, laugh, I look at Renee, uh, Renee Jenkins. She, she drives a van with the kids. They be on there cussing and fussing and all type of crazy stuff. She just be riding, driving. What are we doing? We're, we're, we're sewing into their lives. We're creating an atmosphere for them to learn and hopefully come to know God. They may not never come to this church, and that's fine, but we want to let our light so shine. If they don't know, you know what? There are some good people out here. There are some people that care about me out here, and you, and, you, and you never know how that may perpetuate their life in a better direction. So I'm excited to you all. I mean, I'm excited, and I'm going to tell you all this. God's taking care of us. Come on, as we, as we serve him, he's taking care of us. Father God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. As we leave this place, God, we would not leave your presence. Go with us, stand by us, keep us covered with your blood until we meet again. All God's people say amen, amen, amen. Don't forget to buy the CD and please see my wife about next charity for the leadership meeting. Amen. Happy Mother's Day again. Hugs to my team, love and Jesus, love them too.